Hi, my sweet friends, and welcome back to Crochet Every Day with Judy. We are continuing reading from Swiss Family Robinson, and today we're starting with Chapter 59, The Lime Kiln, Fritz's Story. Fritz, seated in his kajak, served as pilot to assist us in penetrating safely through the rocks and shoals into the bay, where at last we all arrived in safety. Everything was found just as we had left it. The table and benches yet standing, our fireplace undestroyed, and what was more, the air was purified, and the oysters, having all been dried up by the sun, had lost their unpleasant odor. The dead bodies of the lions and the wild boar were bit heaps of whitened bones, the birds of prey having completely stripped them of every particle of flesh. We wished to go direct to Felsenheim immediately, but an unexpected discovery detained us a longer time than we had intended. <laughs> I had noticed among the stones which strewed the shore a sort of rock which it appeared to me could be easily converted into lime. It was a discovery too precious to be neglected, and I resolved to establish a lime kiln without delay on the beach. It did not take us long to make one to suit our purpose, but the calcination of the stones occupied us much longer, and we were obliged to sit up a great part of the night. During this time, we made some barrels of pieces of pine bark circled with strong wi withes of willow. A round piece of bark served for the bottom and another for the cover. To enliven our labor and to abridge the length of the evening, I persuaded Fritz to give us a more complete account than he had hitherto done of the manner in which he had found our new sister and the details of his voyage. It was the best way in which to employ our remaining time, and the curiosity of my sons was so excited that they formed a circle about Fritz, who thus commenced his narration. You all remember, said he to his brothers, the manner in which I left you after having given my father a letter which contained an account of my intended excursion. The sea was calm, but I had scarcely passed the Bay of Pearls when suddenly a violent wind arose, gradually increasing to a perfect hurricane. The rising waves, the rain, the thunder and lightning all confounded in horrible confusion. My little bark was not strong enough to resist the, the tremendous sea, and all that I could do was to abandon myself to the current. After several hours, the wind fell and the air calmed, and my canoe again found its equilibrium upon the surface of the waters. I was far from all the places that we were acquainted with. The tempest had thrown me on a coast entirely new to my eyes. The conformation of the rocks, the gigantic cliffs which seemed to lose themselves in the clouds, the vegetation, the animals I perceived on the coast, the birds which flew about me, all announced a new world. My first care was to look carefully around and see whether some light smoke did not rise behind the rocks, for, as you know, the smoking rock was my only thought. I could perceive nothing as yet, but full of hope I rode along the coast. Night came on, and I passed it in the kajak after having made a miserable supper on pemmican. The next morning I continued my journey, and the farther I advanced, the more the coast appeared to change its aspect. I encountered, from time to time, majestic rivers which flowed silently on and mingled with the sea. The mouth of one of them resembled an immense bay, and I decided to ascend at some little distance. Its banks were covered with large trees, willows, and vines so thickly woven together that they resembled a huge mat covered with birds, monkeys, and even squirrels. Toward the middle of the day, the heat became so insupportable that it was impossible to resist the desire of seeking some shade under the trees. After being slightly refreshed, I pursued my route and sailed on a long time without being able to land. The rivers and shores were both defended by guards I had little desire to come in contact with, for I recognized elephants, lions, panthers, in one word, a complete reunion of all the ferocious animals of creation. After traveling several leagues farther, the appearance of the coast suddenly changed, and as if the ferocious animals had had their district marked out to them, I ceased to perceive any. The shore appeared peaceable, but desolate. The breeze which murmured among the vines and the song of some inoffensive birds were the only noises which broke the calm stillness, and I felt reassured and resolved to land and procure a repast. I accordingly fastened my kajak as strongly as possible and jumped lightly to the shore, and being hungry, I lighted my fire and began to prepare a juicy dinner from a fat goose which I had shot while landing and a dozen of oysters. I rose long before daylight next morning and resumed my voyage. The country through which I now sailed was of an, an, was of an aspect entirely different from any I had ever yet seen. There were beautiful green plains dotted over with clumps of towering palms, little lakes surrounded with osiers, upon the borders of which sported herds of elephants, thick tufts of cactus of all sorts loaded with flowers and fruits which the enormous rhinoceros seemed to devour without paying any attention to the thorns. Beautiful clumps of the mimosa, the high tops of which the towering giraffe devoured with as much facility as a goat would a small shrub. On I sailed, and once more seduced by the picturesque appearance of a river which lost itself in a tranquil bay, I resolved to ascend it. The water slipped gently under the prow of my little kajak. Nothing appeared to indicate any danger. 
There were no serpents on the bank, no horrid beasts in the forest, and I floated tranquilly on enjoying the fresh breeze and the cool shade of the overhanging trees, when suddenly there appeared before me a long throat armed with rows of strong, sharp teeth. It was distended to its full capacity, as if it would take in at one mouthful myself, the Chagak, the Kajak, and the oars. I instantly comprehended the extent of my danger in seizing one of the oars. I drove it with all my strength direct into the yawning mouth of the monster, who disappeared in an instant, leaving a long trace of blood behind him, showing that the wound I had made was of some importance. I did not remain long on this river. Two other monsters of the same nature as the first rose up to the surface of the water. They were alligators, the most terrible kind among these animals, but whose tremendous voracity is happily balanced by a natural laziness, which retains them always near the spot where they were born. I had escaped from one danger only to fall into another. At a little distance from the river of alligators, while coasting along a little wood, I observed that the trees were loaded with the rarest and most beautiful of birds, among which were liras, paroquets, hummingbirds, and birds of paradise. In one word, a complete assemblage of all that array of beautiful plumage which decorates the forests of the new world, and I could not resist the desire of attacking them. I landed, attached my kajak to the bank, and walked up to the wood, holding my eagle unhooded in my hand. I cast him off, and he returned with a superb paroquet, whose flame-colored feathers sparkled in the sun's rays. While I was occupied in examining him, I heard behind me a light rustling on the sand, which I thought was merely caused by a little land turtle or some such animals, and I turned carelessly round. It was well I did so, for not twelve paces from me there was a splendid royal tiger with open mouth, crouched down as if to spring upon me. I stood as if struck with stupor. A mist came over my eyes, and scarcely could I raise my gun, so much had horror paralyzed my strength, when suddenly my brave eagle, comprehending my danger, flew boldly at the advancing tiger and began to pick at his eyes. This timely succor saved me, for it enabled me to collect my senses, and leveling my gun, I discharged it, its contents into the right flank of my enemy, and then two pistol balls loaded in the throat completed my victory. The tiger lay dead, but alas, my victory had cost me dear, for my poor eagle fell at the same time with his conquered enemy, who had seized him in his claws and torn him in pieces. I picked him up, weeping bitterly over my loss, and carried him to the kajak, hoping some day to have him stuffed and placed in our museum. I quitted the shore with a sorrowing mind, and again I prayed to my heavenly father that he would give me strength to continue my voyage. I doubled a little cape, and suddenly from the summit of the gray rocks which bordered the coast, I perceived a light cloud of smoke rising in the air. I, inter I turned my canoe in the direction of the long-sought-for signal. The irregularities of the rocks along the coast were the only difficulties I had, difficulties I had to encounter, and it appeared to me that I should never get through them. At last I landed, and with infinite difficulty scrambled up the rocks until I arrived at a platform on which I perceived a human creature. At the noise which I made in approaching, the individual who was arranging the fire rose, perceived me, uttered a cry of surprise and joy, then joining his hands stood still as if waiting for me to speak. Notwithstanding the midshipman's dress she wore, her exclamation and the delicate contour of her features convinced me that I was in the presence of a female. I stopped about ten paces from her, and calling to my memory all I knew of English, I said in a subdued tone, I am the liberator whom God has sent you. I have received the message of the albatross. I must have pronounced these words very badly, as Emily did not at first comprehend them. I repeated them, however, and after a few moments we understood each other well enough to make a mutual interchange of our feelings. Gestures, looks, accents all filled up the blank that words had left vacant. I spoke to my new sister about the castle of Felsenheim, Falcon's Nest, our shipwreck, and ten years' sojourn on the coast where we lived in almost European luxury. On her part, she recounted to me the history of her childhood, her shipwreck, and existence on the island of the Smoking Rock, making a fine story for my papa to write out in the long winter evenings. Emily graciously invited me to supper, after which we passed the remainder of the night, I in my kajak, she in the branches of a tree, where she always slept from the fear of wild beasts. The next morning we again met. Emily had already prepared breakfast, which consisted of fruit and broiled fish. The repast being over, the sea looked so calm that I thought we had better start. So after packing up all her curiosities and putting them on board the kajak, we took our seats and set off. We sailed on a long time, but an accident happened to my little bark, and I was obliged to put in at the little island which you have called Good Re Rencounter in memory of our meeting. It was there I left my newfound sister, who, doubtful of her reception in a strange family, begged me to go on and ask permission of my father to bring her among them. 
I consented, and my canoe having been repaired, I took the well-known route home. It was then that I encountered you, and from fear that you were pirates, I disguised myself and played you such a trick. Oh, I am so sorry it is done, cried Jack as Fritz finished his story, but you must now tell us the history of our sister. Fritz was about to commence on a new narration of greater interest than the former, but I stopped him and advised him to take a little rest before he talked any more. Chapter 60. Emily's Own Story. Return to Felsenheim with Military Honors. The Winter Season Once More. The story of Fritz had detained us longer than I had anticipated, and as upon looking at my watch, I discovered that it was midnight. The audience were not at all sleepy, however, but as we had to execute labors on the morrow, which would require strength and agility, I thought that if they sat up all night, they would be overwearied the next day. I therefore deemed it necessary to cut short the narration, deferring its completion till a more convenient time. This decision was received with a very bad grace, but it was positive, so each one sought his accustomed resting place either on shore or in the pinnace. The next morning, when all the family were assembled for breakfast, the enterprise and courage of Fritz became the subject of conversation. This naturally brought on the story of last night, and I was obliged to consent that Emily's history should open the day. <coughs> Excuse me. I wanted the dear girl herself to tell it, but she was so timid, though at the same time so lively, busied in her domestic occupations, that I could do nothing with her. Fritz was therefore entreated to act as her proxy and resume his recital. As soon as I was able to understand my new sister, said he, I asked her by what course of events she had been thrown on the desert coast where I now found her. She told me that she was born in India of English parents and that her father, after having served as major in a British regiment, obtained the command of an important Brit English colony. <clears throat> the commandant, Montrose, for that was the name of Emily's father, had the misfortune to lose his wife only three years after his marriage. <clears throat> Excuse me and profoundly afflicted by this loss, all his affections centered in their only child. He took charge of her education and devoted all the time he could spare from his official duties in developing the precious qualities which nature had endowed his dear daughter with. Not content with providing her with every means for mental improvement, he endeavored to make her a strong, healthy woman, capable of facing and resisting danger. Such was Emily's education up to the age of sixteen. She managed a fowling piece as well as a needle and rode as gracefully and firmly as the best cavalry officer, and shone resplendent in her father's brilliant saloons. Major Montrose, having been appointed colonel, was ordered to return with part of his regiment to England. This circumstance forced him to separate himself from his daughter, as naval discipline did not allow women on board a line of battleship in time of war. It was arranged, however, that she should sail the same day that he did in another ship, the captain of which was an old friend of her father's, and who would take every care of his daughter. The voyage at its commencement was prosperous and agreeable, but before many days a terrible tempest arose. The ship was thrown off her course, and a furious wind drove her down upon our rocky coast. Two shallops were launched upon the angry waves, and a chance of safety offered, offered to the shipwrecked. Emily found a place in the smallest, the captain was in the other. The storm continuing, the boats were soon separated, and the one that contained Emily was broken in pieces, and the poor girl alone of all the crew was fortunate enough to escape death. The waves carried her half-fainting to the foot of the rock where I discovered her. She crawled under the shade of a projecting rock and, sinking on the sand, slept for four and twenty hours. There she passed several days, abandoned to dark despair with no nourishment but some bird's eggs which she found on the rocks. At the end of that time, the sun reappearing and the sea growing calm, the poor castaway thought of the crew in the large shallop, and in the hope that they might see her, she resolved to establish signals of distress. As she wore a midshipman's uniform on board ship by order of her father, she had a box in her pocket containing a flint, knife, and other articles. She picked up some pieces of wood, which the sea had thrown on the sand, carried them to the summit of the rock, and there kindled a fire, which she never allowed to go out. You can easily imagine how drearily passed the first days of Emily's exile. She had to contend against all the horrors of hunger and the desert. How thankful she felt for the semi-masculine education that her father had given her. It had endowed her with courage and resolution far beyond her sex. She comprehended the whole extent of her situation, and turning to heaven, she placed her trust in God and hoped on. She built a hut, fished, hunted, tamed birds, among others a cormorant, which she taught to catch fish. In one word, she lived alone with no earthly succor for three long, dreary years. Fritz stopped. His eyes fell upon the heroine of his story, who could hardly conceal her embarrassment. My child, said I, you are but another proof that God never withholds his aid from those who desire it. That which you have done for three years, a poor Swiss family have done for ten, and heavenly aid has never been withheld from them. 
I allowed some little time for commentaries on Emily's history, but as I had resolved that the day should be an active one, I soon gave the signal for work. The manufacturer of lime had succeeded. I submitted some pieces to the proof of water and found it excellent. Toward evening, the pinnace was laden with all that we could carry away, and we talked seriously of returning to Felsenheim. The poetic description we had given concerning the salt grotto and our aerial place at Falcon's Nest had rendered Emily exceedingly curious to judge for herself concerning all these wonders. The next day we weighed anchor just as dawn was breaking. The sail of the pinnace fluttered gaily in the fresh breeze, and Fritz's cajack, containing himself and Francis, went before us as pilots. When we hove in sight of Prospect Hill, I proposed to stop and take a look at the farmhouse. But Fritz and his brother asked permission of me to go on home so that they could have all things prepared for us. I consented and they set out. From Prospect Hill, we sailed to Shark Island where we secured in passing a fine quantity of the soft wool of the Angora rabbits. From Shark Island, we directed our course toward Felsenheim and we could just distinguish it when a salute of 10 guns greeted our ears. This produced a very good effect, Dr. Ernest only regret regretting that the salute was not composed of an odd number of guns. An even number, said he, is entirely contrary to general usage. We returned the polite salute of our two artillerymen by a salvo of 11 guns, the execution of which was undertaken and performed by Jack and Ernest in a style that would have done honor to a practiced cannoneer. Soon after, we saw Fritz and Francis coming toward us in their canoe. They received us at the entrance of the bay and followed us to the shore. They landed before us, and the moment Emily's foot touched the sand, a hurrah resounded through the air, and Fritz, springing forward, presented her his hand like a gallant cavalier and led her up to the portico of the grotto. There a new spectacle awaited us. A table was spread in the middle of the gallery and loaded with all the fruits that the country produced. Bananas, figs, guavas, orange, rose up in perfumed heaps upon flat calabashes. All the vases, coconut cups, and ostrich eggs mounted on turned wooden pedestals, urns of painted porcelain, all were filled with hydromelon milk, while a large dish of fried fish and a huge roast turkey stuffed with truffles formed the solid part of the repast. A double festoon of flowers surrounded the canopy above the table, sustaining a large medallion on which was inscribed, Welcome, Fair Emily Montrose. <coughs> it was a complete holiday and as pompous a reception as our means would allow. Emily sat down to table between my wife and myself. Ernest and Jack also took their places, while the two caterers of the feast, each with a napkin on his arm, did the honors of the table. We passed from the table to the interior of the grotto, and our young companion had the apartment next hours for her use. She could not restrain her admiration at the effects our industry had accomplished. She was astonished that a man and four children could have effected so much. The chateau in the tree at Falcon's Nest next received a visit. It had fallen into decay from neglect, and we passed a whole week in fitting it up. We then set out for Waldeg to gather our rice and other grains, for the season was advancing, and some violent showers already warned us to hasten our preparations for the coming winter. Emily gave proof during these labors of an intelligence and goodwill which rendered her assistance very valuable, and she inspired everybody with such zeal and industry that when the winter set in, we were all prepared for it. Ten years had accustomed us to the terrible winters, and we calmly listened to the wind and storm as it raged furiously without. We had reserved for the winter several sedentary occupations in which our new companion proved her skill and industry. She excelled in weaving and plaiting straw, osiers, etc., and under her direction we made some light straw hats for summer, some elegant baskets, and conveniently arranged game bags. My wife was delighted with her adopted daughter, and Ernest found a companion whose fine education rendered her a conversable and intelligent woman. In fact, Emily had become to my wife and myself a fifth child and a beloved sister for my sons. Chapter 61, Conclusion. It is with a thousand different sensations that I write the word conclusion. It recalls to my mind all that has passed. God is good. God is merciful, is the reigning sentiment in my heart. I have so many reasons for heartfelt gratitude to a gracious providence that I hope the reader will pardon me for the disorder in which I finish my story. It was toward the end of the rainy season. The wind had lost its violence, and a patch of blue sky could now and then be seen. Our pigeons had quitted the dovecote, and we ourselves ventured to open the door of the grotto and taste the fresh air. Our first care was for our gardens, which had suffered injury. We took account of the damage as well as we were able, and then set out for, for our more distant possessions. Fritz and Jack proposed to make an excursion to Shark Island to inspect our fort and colony there. I consented, and they set off in the kajak.
my sons on their arrival, having exa examined the interior of the fort and assured themselves that nothing of importance was damaged, began to look round and see if anything appeared on the horizon. But all was blank. Wishing to see whether the cannons were in good order, they began firing away as if they had all the powder in the world at their command. But what was their astonishment and emotion when a moment after they heard distinctly three reports of a cannon in the distance? They could not be mistaken, for a faint light toward the east preceded each, each report. After a short consultation as to what should be done, the two brothers resolved to hasten home and recount their adventure to us. We had heard the reports of the cannons they had fired, and we could not imagine why they were hurrying back so fast. I called out as loud as I could, Hello there, what is the matter? On they came, and jumping on shore, fell into my arms, faintly articulating, Oh, Papa, Papa, did you not hear them? Hear what? said I. We have heard nothing but the noise you waste of powder made. You have not heard three other reports in the distance? No. Why, we heard them plainly and distinctly. It was the echo, said Ernest. This remark nettled Jack a little, and he replied rather sharply. No, Mr. Doctor, it wasn't the echo. I think I have fired, fired cannons enough in my lifetime to know whether that was an echo or not. We distinctly heard three reports of a cannon, and we are certain that some ship is sailing in this part of the world. If there is really a ship on our coast, said I, who knows whether it is manned by Europeans or by Malay pirates, who knows whether we ought to rejoice or be sorry at its presence, and that instead of preparing for deliverance, should we not make preparations for defense? My first resolution was to organize a system of defense and provide for our safety. We watched alternately under the gallery of the grotto so that we could be ready in case of surprise. But the night passed quietly away, and in the morning the rain commenced and continued so violently during two long days that it was impossible for us to go out. On the third day, the sun reappeared. Fritz and Jack, full of impatience, resolved to return to Shark Island and try a new signal. I consented, but instead of the kajak, we took the canoe and I went with them. On arriving at the fort, we hoisted our flag while Jack, ever impatient, loaded a cannon and fired it. But scarcely had the report died away in the distance when we distinctly heard a louder answering report in the direction of Cape Disappointment. Jack could not contain himself for joy. Men, men, cried he, dancing about us. Men, Papa, are you sure of it now? And his enthusiasm communing its, communicating itself to us, we hoisted another and a larger flag on our flagstaff. Six other reports followed the first one we had heard. Overpowered with emotion, we hastened to our boat and were soon in the presence of the family. They had not heard the seven reports, but they had seen our two flags flying, and they were eagerly and they were eagerly awaiting circumstantial news. I ordered that everything in the grotto should be put in a place of safety. My three youngest sons, my wife and Emily, set off for Falcon's Nest with our cattle, and I embarked in the Kajak with Fritz to reconnoiter. It was near midday when we set out. We coasted along without discovering anything, and the illusion of the moment began to dissipate. On more calm reflection, however, the certainty that we had heard the seven reports of the cannon kept our, up our, our courage, when suddenly, on doubling a little promontory which had hitherto concealed it from us, we beheld a fine European ship majestically reposing at anchor, with a longboat at the side, and an English flag floating at the masthead. I seek in vain to find words that will express the sentiment which filled our souls. We elevated our hands and eyes toward heaven, and thus returned our thanks to God for his great beneficence. If I had permitted it, Fritz would have thrown himself into the sea and swum off to the ship. But I was afraid that notwithstanding the English flag, the vessel before us might be a Malay corsair, which had assumed false colors in order to deceive other vessels. We remained at a distance, not liking to venture near without being more certain, to what, certain what it was. We could see all that was passing on board the vessel. Two tents had been raised on the shore, tables were laid for dinner, quarters of meat were roasting before blazing fires, men were running to and fro, and the whole scene had the appearance of an organized encampment. Two sentinels were on the deck of the vessel, and when they perceived us, they spoke to the officer on duty who stood near, and who turned his telescope toward us. "'They are Europeans,' cried Fritz. "'You can easily judge from the face of the officer. Malay certainly, certainly would be more dusky than that.' Fritz's remark was true, but yet I did not like to go too near. We remained in the bay, maneuvering our canoe with all the dexterity of which we were capable. We sang a Swiss mountain song, and when we had finished, I cried out through my speaking trumpet these three words— Englishmen, good men, but no answer was returned. Our song, our kajak, and more than all our costume, I expect, marked us for savages, from the officer making signs to us to approach, and holding up knives, scissors, and glass beads, for which the savages of the new world are generally so desirous. This mistake made us laugh, but we did not approach, as we wished to present ourselves before them in better trim. We contented ourselves with exclaiming once more, Englishmen, and then darted off as fast as our boat could carry us. 
We passed a whole day in preparing the pinnace and loading it with presents for the captain as we wished him to see that those whom he had taken for savages were being far advanced in the arts of civilization. We set off at sunrise. The weather was magnificent and we sailed gallantly along, Fritz preceding us as pilot. When we could clearly distinguish the ship, a sensation of vivid joy was experienced by us all. My sons were dumb with pleasure and eagerness. Hoist the English flag, cried I in the voice of a stentor, and a second after, a flag similar to the one on the ship fluttered from our masthead. If we were filled with extraordinary emotions on seeing a European ship, the English were not less astonished to see a little boat with flowing sails coming toward them. Guns were now fired from the ship and answered from our pinnace, and joining Fritz and his Kajak, we approached the English ship to welcome the captain to our shores. The captain received us with that frankness and cordiality that always distinguishes sailors, and conducted us to the cabin where a flask of Cape wine cemented the alliance between us. I recounted to the captain as briefly as possible the history of our shipwreck and our sojourn of ten years on this coast. I spoke to him of Emily and asked him if he had ever heard of her father, Sir Edward Montrose. The captain not only knew him, but it was part of his instructions to explore these latitudes, where three years before the ship Dorcas, which had on board the daughter of Commander Montrose, was supposed to have been wrecked, and to try to discover whether any tidings of the vessel or crew could be ascertained. In consequence, he manifested the greatest desire to see her and assure her that her father was alive. He informed us that a tempest of four days' duration had thrown him off the course which he followed for Sydney and New Holland, and thus he had been driven on this coast, where he had renewed his wood and water. It was then, added he, that we heard the reports of cannon which we answered. On the third day, new discharges convinced us that we were not alone on the coast, and we resolved to wait until, by some means or other, we discovered who were our companions in misfortune. But we find an organized colony and a maritime power whose alliance I solicit in the name of the Sovereign of Great Britain. This last sally made us laugh and we cordially pressed the hand which Captain Littleton extended to us. The rest of the family were waiting some distance off in the pinnace. We took leave of the captain who, ordering his gig to be manned, arrived on board our vessel almost as soon as we did. We received him with every demonstration of joy and friendship, and Emily was half wild with happiness at the sight of a fellow countryman and one who brought intelligence of her father. The captain brought with him an English family whom the fatigues of the passage had rendered ill, consisting of Mr. Woolston, a distinguished machinist, his wife, and two daughters. My wife offered Mrs. Woolston her assistance and promised her that her family should find every comfort and convenience at Felsenheim if they would return with us. They gladly consented and we set out with them taking leave of the captain who did not like to pass the night away from his ship. My readers can form an idea of the astonishment which was evinced by the Wollstone family on seeing all our establishments. We ostentatiously pointed out to them Felsenheim with its rocky vault, the giant tree of Falcon's Nest, Prospect Hill, and all the marvels which were comprised in our domains. A frugal repast in the evening united both families under the gallery of the grotto, and my wife prepared in the interior apartments and beds to receive the newcomers. The next morning, Mr. Wollstone came up to me and tenderly stretching out his hand spoke as follows. Sir, said he, I cannot express all the admiration that I feel in regarding the wonders with which you are surrounded. The hand of God has been with you, and here you live happily, far away from the strife of the world, among the works of creation, alone with your family. I came from England to seek repose. Where can I find it better than here? And I shall esteem myself the happiest of men if you will allow me to establish myself in a corner of your domains. This proposition of Mr. Wollstone filled me with joy, and I immediately assured him that I would willingly share with him the half of my patriarchal empire. Mr. Wollstone hastened to communicate to his wife the success of his application, and the morning was devoted to the joy and pleasure that this news caused. But considerations of a painful nature occupied my mind. The ship which now presented itself was the second only we had seen in ten years, and probably as long a period might elapse before another appeared, should we let Captain Littleton and his ship leave us without any addition to his crew. These questions affected the dearest interests of our family. My wife did not wish to return to Europe. I was myself too much attached to my new life to leave it, and we were both at an age when hazards and dangers have no attraction, and ambition has resolved itself into a desire for repose. But our children were young. Their life was but just commencing, and I did not think it right to deprive them of the advantages which civilization and a contact with the world presented. And then again Emily, since she had heard that her father was in England, did not conceal her desire to return. And although we regretted losing this amiable girl, yet it was impossible to detain her. So at last I decided to call my children together. 
and ascertain their sentiments. I spoke to them of civilized Europe, of the resources of every kind which society offered to its members, and I asked them if they would depart with Captain Littleton or be content to pass the remainder of their lives upon this coast. Jack and Ernest declared that they would rather remain. Ernest, the philosopher, had no need of the world to interrupt his studies, and Jack the hunter found the domain of Falcon's Nest large enough for his excursions. Fritz was silent, but I saw by his countenance that he had decided to go. I encouraged him to speak. He confessed that he had a great desire to return to Europe, and his younger brother Francis declared that he would willingly accompany him. Mr. Wolfson also dismembered his family. He kept but one of his daughters. The other went on to New Holland. These family arrangements were very painful, and, until they, and when they were finished, I hastened to inform the captain of the unicorn. He readily consented to take our three passengers. I resign three persons, said he, Mr. and Mrs. Wollston, and one of their daughters. I take three more, and my com compliment will not be affected. The unicorn remained eight days at anchor, and we employed them in preparing the cargo which was to be the fortune of our voyagers on arriving in Europe. All the riches that we had amassed, pearls, ivory, spices, furs, and all our rare productions, were carefully packed and put on board the ship, which we also furnished with meat and fruits. On the eve of their departure, after having exhausted myself in a last conversation in which I advised my sons always to carry out the principles in which they had been instructed, and so to live in this world that we might, through the merits of our Savior, be united in the next, I gave Fritz this narration of our shipwreck and establishment on the desert coast, enjoining him expressly to have it published as soon after his arrival as he possibly could. And this desire on my part, exempt from all vanity of authorship, had for its only object and hope that it might be useful to others as a lesson of morality, patience, courage, perseverance, and of Christian submission to the will of God. Perhaps some day a father may take courage from the manner in which we supported our tribulations. Perhaps some young, some young person will see in the course of this narrative the value of a varied education and the importance of becoming acquainted with first principles. I have not written this as a learned man would have done, and all my results may not have been arrived at according to the correct theory, but we were in an extraordinary position and were obliged to depend upon our own resources. We placed our entire trust in the mercy of God, and he ever watched over and protected us. We none of us slept much during the last night. At the dawn of day, the cannon of the ship announced the order to go on board. We conducted our children to the shore. There they received our last embraces and benedictions. The anchor has been weighed, the sails unfurled, the flag run up to the masthead, and a rapid wind promises speedily to separate us from our children. I will not attempt to paint the grief of my dear Elizabeth. It is the grief of a mother, silent and profound. Jack and Ernest are weeping bitterly, and my own grief and heartfelt sorrow is, I must confess, but badly conce concealed. I finish these few lines whilst the ship's boat is waiting. My sons will thus receive my last blessing. May God ever be with you. Adieu, Europe. Adieu, dear Switzerland. Never shall I see you again. May your inhabitants be always happy, pious, and free. The end. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye.